Good evening, everyone, or I guess I should say good morning, because some of you are in areas where it's morning, and uh, good afternoon, because some of you are in areas where it's afternoon. Why? Because when people hear that Act 17 has something going down, they can't stay away worldwide. That's just a fact. So, uh, evening, everyone, or I guess... Hey! <laughs> <laughs> You know what's funny? You just did that, but it was about it was one second away from doing it on my computer, <laughs> I, so I, I was able to I was able to to jump out and uh, hit, hit the turn the sound off there. I, I don't know why I don't know why I forget that every time. But uh, anyway, we learn we learn we learn. Still a little bit new to us. All right, so this is answering Islam live, where we take questions from uh, our patrons on Patreon. Take questions from uh, the comments section from the from the previous video. We take questions from the super chat and the chat here. So we are going to jump right in with a couple of questions, and then after that, we'll uh, we'll turn to the to chat and see what's going on over there. So welcome everyone. Oh, by the way, if you didn't catch my video earlier, then then after this, um, you want to check out the video I posted earlier where, where I got a a message from YouTube saying that. Uh, a video had been blocked in Germany, and it has nothing to do with Germany. Um, it was accused of being hate speech. There's nothing that would remotely... Hmm. Uh-oh. Yeah, you're frozen. Yeah. I should say good morning. Oops. All right, no, I, you're not. All right, I think I'm going again. All right, everyone, we are having some internet problems. There's been some local internet problems, uh, mainly today, that are much worse than normal. Um, lots of times if I upload a video, it'll take me, uh, sometimes if, if things are going really well, it'll take two or three minutes to upload a video. Um, other times it might take me 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, today it was taking hours to upload a video. So uh, hopefully this gets better. And if it doesn't, we're just going to have to we're just going to have to cancel it for today. So uh, let's give this about five to ten more minutes, and then we're just going to have to cancel. Uh, the The internet is usually the internet is usually not this bad. Um, this is some sort of fluke today, maybe because uh, there's a there's a heat wave here. Maybe people are staying home and not going out and doing stuff, and everyone's on their internet. So that could be a problem. And how's it looking there, Anthony? Are you getting yeah, everything's fine over here. No, I mean, I mean, do you see that it's uh, that it's working or not? Yeah, it it looks like it's working here. The people in the chat uh, are still going. They're they're okay. saying it's working. Am I broadcasting? Yeah. Okay, because uh, <laughs> since I'm using the internet over here, uh, this one is getting the uh, the little circular motion. All right, people are saying I'm coming in loud and clear. We're going to try this. Um, but it's it's not it's not a terrible disaster if there's a problem and we just have to postpone things until tomorrow when things should be better. Um, all right, so uh, yeah, so anyway, I posted a video earlier today. Again, took uh, took a long time to upload, but it's about YouTube um, saying that uh, Germany is now cracking down on hate speech. But if you look at the content they're actually cracking down on, has nothing has nothing to do with. Uh, with um, condemning Muslims or calling for violence against Muslims. It's all just something I said about Muhammad, which was directly from the Muslim sources, that now qualifies as criminal hate speech in Germany. You're not allowed to say it. So the, this is a, a very disturbing trend, but I encourage everyone after this to go ahead and watch that, and we'll see where these things lead. All right, so let's go ahead and take a question here. And this comes from a patron. This is about a Bible contradiction. Anthony. So, a uh, patron asks, Me and a Muslim were discussing about the reliability of the Bible. He said, The Bible has many contradictions, like, If you read about the counting of the people in Second Samuel 24, then uh, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he, the Lord, incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. And in 1 Chronicles 21.1, then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So was it God or Satan? How to react? So in case anyone, 
in case you haven't read the passages, the basic idea is that you weren't supposed to go around counting up your soldiers all the time uh, in an attempt to see how powerful you were, um, because this would it would it would seem like you don't re you're not really having confidence in God and you want to sort of boast in your numbers. And so we have two passages here, and one says that God incited David to go up and number all the people, and the other says that Satan incited him. Two different passages. So, was it God, or was it Satan, or Anthony? Is there a way to reconcile these passages? Right. So, uh, the basic answer is that God, being sovereign, is able to use even sinful creatures to accomplish holy ends. Uh, Augustine, uh, in the 4th century, once said that God can strike a straight blow uh, with a crooked stick. And the idea is, essentially, that, that God can be holy and wise and just and good and use sinful creatures who have altogether different purposes. You can see this repeatedly throughout Scripture. Uh, for example, in Isaiah 10, the Lord speaks of using Assyria to punish rebellious Israel for her idolatry. But Assyria was just as rebellious as Israel was, and just as much given to idolatry and uh, rebellion against the Lord. And so in the passage in Isaiah 10, it says that Assyria has one thing planned in its heart. Its goal is to desire uh, uh, a belt. Pa pa pause, or pause it, Anthony. It says, uh, it says the streaming stopped again. So um, basically, if... Uh... All right, everyone. All right, everyone, it's at, we had the second problem, so we'll go ahead and set and try this one more time, and then if you all want to call it until tomorrow, we'll call it until tomorrow. Or we can just interact with people in the chat, and then if the Internet goes goes out, um, again, this is a, if you're just tuning in, there's been uh, massive Internet problems in New York uh, all day today. Um, so not sure how well this is going to go. Uh, we'll go and try this. If it goes out one more time, then... Um, if people want to stick around and just chat, then we'll, we'll do the chat. And if not, then uh, we, we can we can uh, we can call it a day. And uh, hopefully things are cleared up tomorrow. Temperature is supposed to start dropping down tomorrow. Um, so anyway, that's the theory that since ev no one wants to go outside because it's boiling outside, everyone went inside and everyone's using their internet and it's destroying the internet. So uh, go ahead and continue there, uh, Anthony. Um, and you might want to back up a little bit because we're not exactly sure where things dropped off. Yeah, okay, so uh, basically what I was saying is that God being sovereign is able to use sinful creatures and their uh, wicked motivations for his own holy purposes and just ends. And you see that throughout Scripture. The example I was giving is from Isaiah 10, where God refers to Assyria as the club of his uh, wrath. He's using Assyria to punish rebellious Israel, even though Assyria's purpose is to wipe out and destroy God's people, not be an instrument of chastisement. And so there you have an example of God doing something even through wicked or evil instruments. And this shouldn't be uh, something that we would object to. Anyone who believes that God is active in history and is using people has to believe that God uses even wicked or evil people or people who are not perfect, because there simply isn't anyone who isn't perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also have the, the classic example in the Old Testament is in Genesis 50, where Jacob's brothers, or Joseph's brothers, uh, are now frightful of the fact that Joseph might punish them because he has the power to do so, uh, because they had sold him into slavery uh, years before. And when they come to Joseph and are begging him not to punish them, he says, you intended this for evil, but God intended it for good. The classic example of this in the New Testament is in Acts 2 and Acts 4, where the apostles say that the men of Israel are wicked and through uh, their corrupt actions, they put the Lord Jesus to death, but God had intended it for our good, for the salvation of the world. And so, again, we have the example of God using wicked agents to accomplish holy ends. Now, we're not permitted to do that sort of thing precisely because we are not sovereign. We can't guarantee the outcome. So uh, somebody can't use this as justification for saying that the ends justify the means. Um, so, uh, I mean, we could give other examples of this, uh, but really it's all throughout Scripture. Anytime God uses someone, he's using somebody who's less than perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing I would add is you, you actually have a sneak peek of just this sort of thing in the first two chapters of the book of Job. Remember, Satan wants to do something, 
uh, but he has to come before the Lord before he can carry it out. And, the, and so ultimately the Lord is is in control of things, uh, but Satan has one intention, the Lord has another. The Lord believes, uh, and not just believes, but the Lord knows the character of Job and that Satan's uh, efforts to get him to uh, rebel against him won't uh, prosper. Uh, but Satan's intention is, of course, to get Job to curse God and die. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... So if we wanted to if we wanted to think about someone who is good and just using someone who's uh, wicked and unjust to um, to achieve justice and judgment on someone, uh, I guess we could think of like uh, you know a, a good police officer who uh, uses a uh, an informant who is otherwise a pretty bad dude or something like this to uh, go out and get some information on someone so that this person can ultimately be. Uh, caught, tried, and convicted, but um, that would uh, that would be the reconciliation, ladies and gentlemen. So if if if, uh, if it's Satan in one passage, God in another, uh, does that mean God is Satan, or that we have a contradiction here? Uh, well, no. If God is doing something by using Satan, then there goes there goes the problem. Um, all right. So <laughs> all right, we're let, let's. Uh, All right, can you see the chat? Let's just interact with the chat. All right, everyone, uh, the Internet problems are too horrible here for us to uh, proceed as wanted, so um, we're not going to have our... Uh, the, the questions we're going to deal with that we had pulled up, um, we'll just uh, wait for those to till tomorrow. Uh, but right now, we'll interact with those of you who want to stick around, and we'll interact with you uh, in the chat. Um, and so if there's, since the internet has always gone, has already gone out like three times in a couple of minutes, we can assume that there, the problems are going to continue today. Just a bad day in New York for internet. Um, but if you can live with that and you want to talk in the chat, then we'll go ahead and talk in the chat. So Anthony. Yes. What do you see in the chat that you want to uh, respond to? I don't know if I should scroll all the way back up to the beginning or scroll to the end. Huh. But, uh, yeah. Uh, uh. Benji Boy says, May Lord Jesus' peace be with the saints. Amen. Amen. Um, people are saying you're not frozen. I know for a fact I was frozen because uh, the, the Internet actually cut off here. Um, so maybe at particular times we weren't, uh, <laughs> we weren't cut off. Uh, someone says, Pay your bill. No, this is not a bill problem. I have, I'm supposed to have uh, top-notch internet here and normally it is super fast um, approaching uh, around 300 uh, megabits per second and so that would not be a problem right now it's running at around 5 to 10 <laughs> and so that's that's uh, that's not that's like bare minimum for even attempting to uh, to live stream something so that's that's kind of bare minimum um, and then, uh, and, it, and then it's a problem that it's also fluctuating, right? It's going up and down. So just a horrible, horrible day. But I had already told everyone we're going to be here, so we're going to react in the comments. Uh, you see someone you're on? You see some, I, There's a ton here. We can go through them and, and look at comments. There's a, but. There's a question for you. It's uh, can you beat uh, James White in a 100-meter sprint? Uh, yeah. He probably, <laughs> he, he, yes. Hey, I'm fast for as big as I am. I've always shocked, I've always shocked people. Um <laughs> But uh, on a now on a bike, James James would kill me. On, uh, you put you put wheels on him, James is going to annihilate me. But uh, yeah, hundred meter dash. Oh, uh, I, I I had these friends that used to like racing backwards, uh, running backwards. It was the funniest thing. Uh, so I, maybe we can get you two out there running backwards and film it and uh, use it for a video. Um, here's one. Tyler Owens says, do Muslims say that Paul corrupted Jesus' teachings? So are we answering these live or are we texting them? No, we're, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're going to do it live, but we're, uh, yeah. So for, for the rest of this, we're going to, we're, we're, we're going to stay here. Um, there are over 200 people here. Um, okay. I've told them basically that there are internet problems, probably going to zone out. It seems to it seems to kick back on here after just a uh, after a few seconds when it when it does go out. So it didn't stay out. So it's it's basically a slight annoyance. But this would be a good time because we said last week that we get so many comments and we only respond to a couple that it would be good if we actually 
uh, took some time to, to focus mainly on the on the comments. So this would be a good time because if if people wanted to see us respond to um, some of the uh, some of the comments on the videos last week or something like that, that's fine. But if they just want to interact, then this would be a good time to do it. Um, so that so people basically people could stick around if they want to if they want to chat. And so, do Muslims say that Paul corrupted Jesus' teachings? What say you, Anthony? Yes, yes, they Tyler's do. About comment. Oh, yeah? Um, so, first of all, Muslims have not always said that Paul corrupted Jesus' teachings. When you look at the early Islamic sources, Paul is recognized as a righteous teacher. They don't refer to him as an apostle, but they do refer to him as uh, a follower of Christ and somebody who uh, taught the truth about Jesus. What's happened is Muslims have always sort of followed along after whatever popular uh, theory was, you know, reigning at the time, and and I'd say in the nineteen <laughs> went out again. Oh man! All right, ladies and gentlemen, we understand this is a problem. It's a problem for us as well. It's a super annoying problem, but we told everyone we're going to be here, so um, treat this as a mild distraction. There are people who've had it worse down through history. Um, so we were talking about uh, Paul, interestingly, being recognized as a reliable, um, a reliable Christian witness in the early centuries of Islam and through many centuries of Islam. And uh, what's interesting is I can Muslims have to argue one or the other based on what their sources say, right? So the Quran says that Allah is going to um, preserve the true Christians, that he's going to give victory to the true Christians, and that no one can change his words, no one's going to be able to corrupt this, but uh, Allah says that he gave the victory to the true Christians. Now, um, if you open up uh, Yusuf Ali's commentary, says this refers to Christians taking over the Roman Empire. But think about this. The Christians who took over the Roman Empire believed in Jesus' death, resurrection, and deity, believed in the teachings and the writings of the Apostle Paul. So for the early Muslims, if you're thinking about this, you just you can't even comprehend that someone came along and corrupted Christianity, right? It, it doesn't make any sense. Allah miraculously served the true witnesses of Jesus. So if Paul is one of those people who spread Christianity, then obviously Paul's a good guy. So that I can see how that follows. Um, but there's a problem, namely the teachings of Paul contradict the teachings of Muhammad on a fundamental level. So the other conclusion to draw is that Paul has to be a deceiver. And the reason Muslims focus, by the way, so much on the apostle Paul uh, isn't because Paul is especially evil or anything like that, or, or especially suspect. It's that the Quran claims that Jesus was a devout Muslim and that his, his original apostles were devout Muslims. And yet, the teachings of Jesus that we have don't line up with Islam. So Muslims have to say that it was corrupted. And you can have ignorant Muslims who will say something about the Council of Nicaea, not realizing that we can trace the main doctrines of Christianity to long before the Council of Nicaea. And so they'll have to say, if you're a knowledgeable Muslim, you have to say that the doctrines of Christianity were corrupted in the first century. And now you've got a problem. If the doctrines of Christianity were corrupted in the first century, who could have corrupted it? You can't say Jesus, and you can't say his original apostles, they were devout Muslims. So you need someone who wasn't Jesus, wasn't one of his original apostles, who was still powerful enough to change the course of Christianity. And the only name Muslims have been, come, been able to come up with is the Apostle Paul. So the hostility towards Paul that you find among Muslims um, isn't because Paul is bad or something like that. It's there's no one else to blame. If Paul is a good guy, then Muhammad is simply wrong. So they have to heap abuse on the Apostle Paul. Uh, you want to add to that, Anthony? No, no, that's good. Uh, I would also say, as I, I was pointing out, that uh, they get some... Uh, encouragement in this because liberals have a similar dilemma, right? They need to account for how a, a Jewish guy was going around claiming to be God and was crucified for it. Mm -hmm. And since that can't be what Jesus was claiming, uh, then somebody else has to have uh, made that up and put it in his mouth. And so Paul has become, for many of them, the great uh, boogeyman. 
What's interesting, though, is often along with this, it's true for liberals, it's true for Muslims, they'll often uh, set up people like James, the Apostle uh, James, uh, as uh, somebody who is trustworthy. Uh, and here I'm using the word apostle in the secondary sense. Obviously, uh, uh, Christ's half-brother James was not one of the original uh, followers of Christ, but he was converted as a result of seeing the risen Lord. Uh, but So Muslims will often point to James because they think that James doesn't have some of those distinctive teachings. And yet you do find in James very clear witness, even though it's a short epistle, we only have one epistle from James, it's only five chapters, we can't expect it to say everything, uh, but in the epistle of James he very clearly witnesses to the deity of Christ. In James 2.1 he refers to Christ as the Lord of glory, and the construction in Greek is is very significant. It literally says the Lord of the glory. So it's it's appositional, which means uh, one phrase interprets the other. So when he's referring to Jesus as the Lord, he means the glory. And if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know what that means. Throughout the Old Testament, the glory was a peculiar way of referring uh, to God. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, it speaks of the divine glory. Uh, that was Israel's, in fact, distinctive privilege among the nations, that the divine glory dwelt in her midst. And so for James, Jesus' half-brother, to say that Jesus is the Lord of glory is to give a clear witness to Christ's deity in a way that was unmistakable to any first century Jew. All right, let's go through some uh, more questions here. Um, JP asks, can speaking against Jesus be classified as hate speech? And uh, <laughs> the answer we all know is no. Now, now the question is one of consistency, right? Um, it's always Muhammad, right? When we're talking about uh, classifying speech as hate speech for criticizing some religious figure, it's always, it's always Muhammad, right? No, no one, no one throws a tantrum if you make fun of Buddha. No one throws a tantrum if you make fun of Confucius. No one throws a tantrum if you make fun of Moses or Jesus or Paul. As soon as you make fun of Muhammad, then all of a sudden there are discussions of hate speech and how we can make laws to do something about that hate speech. And what, what's amazing is Western leaders and politicians and educators in Hollywood, they don't seem to understand uh, how they're being manipulated here, if you think about it, right? Because not criticizing Muhammad, that's Sharia. That's Sharia. But Muslims in the West understand that they can't enforce Sharia by straightforward physical threats of violence always, right? You can do that in the Middle East. So in the Middle East and in Muslim countries, you can stop, you can physically stop people from criticizing Muhammad. You can beat them to death in the streets, or you can bring them up on blasphemy charges, throw them in jail, sentence them to death. But you have Muslims in the West who, many of whom want the same thing, many of whom want criticism of Muhammad stopped, but they're not able to enforce it the same way they would in a Muslim country. And so they use other means and they're very creative in their means of manipulation. But Western leaders fall for it. They fall for it over and over again. And I'm, I'm willing to lay this down as a rule. If you are extremely susceptible to manipulation such that any Muslim who comes up to you and starts complaining that, um, that, it's really, really hurting his feelings that people are criticizing Muhammad, and boy, you'd be really, really great um, if you stopped that and somehow convinces you as a Western leader who, who is supposedly here to protect people's rights, and you can be convinced that criticizing this one guy in all of history is hate speech, and if anyone criticizes this one guy, it means they want to kill all Muslims or something. If you're that gullible, you probably shouldn't have a place of leadership in any Western nation. Um, any, any you want to respond to, Anthony? Uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, some of this is just, just chat. Um, um, someone said, uh, uh, Georgie said, the question, the prophet of Islam killed or ordered to kill a human being? Yes or no? Yes. A lot of times. <laughs> a lot of times. Um, 
ordered his followers to kill apostates, ordered them to uh, kill unbelievers in a variety of contexts, so um, ordered them to kill um, people who'd committed various crimes, so that is yes a lot of times. Oh, someone actually responded right after that. Yes, if anyone leaves the religion, kill them. So uh, people started giving the actual response here. Maybe I should go to the end instead of reading down because some people are responding to the questions. Yeah, Khan Sarbani uh, ha says, we Muslims treat Islam as true way of life, but you Christians simply follow Christianity as a hobby on the side. This shows the difference in Iman and values we have for our religion. Uh, Do you just follow Christianity as a hobby, Anthony? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, <laughs> this, this isn't your racquetball? <laughs> no? I'm sure what he thinks uh, he, he's referring to is the idea that Islam is a comprehensive way of life that encompasses politics and everything else under the sun. I would say that, that it might be true that certain Christians believe that Christianity is irrelevant to those things, but I don't think we would say that. Uh, you know, we don't believe that God told us things like how to, you know, go to the bathroom because we think that's the sort of thing that uh, people can f figure out on their own. Yeah. Uh, if you need a special revelation for that, then you probably uh, need a religion that has a lot of other silly teachings as well, um, you know, such as uh, what to do when you don't have uh, three stones or, you know, what have you. But uh, we're going to need a fatwa yeah, on that to figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I think that Muslims are uh, misguided because they assume that if Christianity doesn't spell out every detail, then Christianity is irrelevant to the details. But that's just not true. We, we don't have a view of the world that says uh, a special revelation is needed from God to tell us how to put on our shoes or how to walk into a room and that sort of thing. We believe that all of life is to be lived to the glory of God. Uh, but we don't think that God is particularly glorified or not by whether we, uh, you know, uh, put on our left shoe first or our right shoe first. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, it's always struck me as, as rather silly that uh, that Islam has to have all these rules for everything, assuming that we can't figure them out. And, and the, the goal there, if you think about it, is to turn people into like mindless <laughs> drones, right? Like, like, figure out how to use the bathroom effectively <laughs> on your own. No, we can't do that. We might do it wrong. We need God to tell us how to do that. The result of that is is a community that simply mindly, mindlessly obeys every little detail and then can never figure out how to do anything on their own. And guess what? Why, why don't you see uh, a, a tremendous scientific outpouring in the Muslim world? or philosophical outpouring in the Muslim world. You did have those at specific times in Islamic history where Muslims would conquer an area that had a lot of philosophical works, um, where Muslims would conquer an area that was doing work in science, and Muslims would put these things to use for a while, but it just never lasted in the Muslim world. Why? Well, there's this constant retrograde force telling you that God wants you to live and think and breathe and eat and sleep like a seventh century Arab, and that's the only way to please God. And so when, you're, when you actually take it into your heart that Islam means submission, and if you want to submit to Allah, there's, there's just all these tiny little things you have to do throughout your life. Um, that's not exactly a good recipe for, uh, for your ability to think at all, your ability to reason. Right? Christianity has principles. Um, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Notice, if you take these principles to heart, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of mystery about how you should act. You have to think about it, but you don't need tons of little rules for every little thing, right? If uh, you wouldn't even need you wouldn't even need the rule um, like don't steal. You don't need a rule like that because if you think, wait a minute, do unto others as I would have them do unto me. Would I want someone stealing my stuff? No. Okay. Well, I should act the same that I would towards this person as I, as I would want this person to act towards me. And so Christianity gives principles. Um, it does have rules, to be clear, um, but they're rules on kind of important things, right? Things that matter. But other than that, we're encouraged to, to take Christian principles and to apply them to different situations. And Muslims just aren't. It's, hey, if you don't have a rule, you have no idea. You don't know how to go to the bathroom. 
And that's that's so silly. Um, I mean, we are we are created in the image of God, and in Christianity, that that means something, right? That, that we're created in the image of God. We ultimately become children of God. And in Islam, think about this, ladies and gentlemen. In Islam, the highest relationship you can have with Allah is a slave to master relationship. The Quran says that there is none. No one approaches him but as a slave. Now think about this. Your slave, if you have a slave, you want the slave doing exactly what you say. Right? You want the slave doing exactly what you say. Slave, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. Um, if someone is your child, you have rules for him as time goes on. But as he matures, as he gets older, you want him to, to develop the ability to think for himself. Uh, when he's in a variety of situations. And so the goal in Christianity is God wants us to become mature human beings. Um, in Islam, Allah wants us to be the perfect slaves who mindlessly do exactly what they're told. Um, yeah, It's interesting, real quick, David, uh, you mentioned the image of God. It's, it's interesting in Genesis 1 when God creates man in his image, it's, it's precisely then that God says, to man at the beginning to have dominion over everything that he has created. And the idea of dominion is to uh, involves the exploration, searching, discovering, and so forth. Uh, you have uh, in Proverbs 25, 1, an example of this with respect to kings. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the idea is that God has uh, made all sorts of things possible, and it's it's up to us in in a number of respects to go and and figure things out. Uh, so it's we're not just mindless robots or, as you said, uh, zombies. Uh, and that's part and parcel of what it means to be made in God's image. Mm -hmm. um, Kong says, "Isn't the Quran a hate speech itself?" Um, mm -hmm. And that would depend on what you mean by hate speech. Um, I don't I don't believe in in banning books and things like that. I believe in refuting them. But here again, once again, a question of consistency. If you're going to say that me criticizing Muhammad, stating facts about Muhammad is hate speech, then how do you not look at the Quran and see that according to the Quran, Jews and Christians are the worst of creatures? Surah 98 verse 6. Muslims are the best of peoples ever raised up for mankind. Surah 3 verse 110. How do you not read commands to fight people based on their beliefs? Like Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah. If what I'm doing is hate speech just by criticizing a man who's been dead for nearly 14 centuries, um, if mere, mere criticism counts as hate speech, how does, how does claims that one people group, entire people groups, are the worst of creatures? They're lower than insects. How is that not hate speech? And so that would be the question. And I, I think that is a question that um, whenever anyone has the opportunity to ask this question of a leader, whenever there's an open forum, um, to stand up and say, hey, if what this person over here did was hate speech, then why is the Quran not hate speech? And uh, the, basic, the basic rule there would be come up with some consistent basis. Um, if you're going to say that what this person said was hate speech, then all the more you have to call the Quran hate speech. But they don't want to do that. And so the solution is, okay, if you're not going to call the Quran hate speech, don't call what these other people are saying, criticizing Muhammad, hate speech, because it's just not. Um, Rentable said, do you think making a Cartesian demonstration has any chance of working with the average Muslim? Or are we bound to your style of making fun of Islam? I don't feel comfortable proceeding this way. Well, no one is bound. No one is bound by my method except me. Right? I'm, the one who, I'm the one who's bound. Um, what I've found is, is that this is, a, this is an approach that works with Muslims. Muslims pay attention. Um, they might throw tantrums. They might get angry at you. They might run around to Christians and say, oh, look, that guy's so mean. We won't listen to that guy. But history shows they are listening and they actually pay attention. Um, so that's just my approach. Now, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by Cartesian demonstration. If you mean the kind of demonstration that Descartes gives in, um, in the meditations, where he starts from something that's 
uh, absolutely indubitable. He can't deny his own existence, and then he can't deny that he has ideas, and then proceeding there step by step in some sort of irrefutable fashion. Um, would that work with a Muslim? Uh, you could you could try and see how that works. I don't know what exactly your Cartesian demonstration would be. There are certain things that you could point to that are like that, like the Islamic dilemma is kind of like this, right? When we point out that the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, and yet the Quran contradicts, on a fundamental level, the Jewish and Christian scriptures, then you only have two possibilities. Uh, either we have the Word of God or we don't have the Word of God. We've got something corrupt or something else, right? If we have the Word of God, if what we have is the inspired, preserved, authoritative Word of God, then Islam is false because it contradicts what we have. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative Word of God, then Islam is false because Islam affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of our scriptures. So if we have the Word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the Word of God, Islam is false. Um, either way, Islam is false. And I think that's about as close as you can get to something, um, something indisputable. Uh, now, with that said, Muslims will argue against it, but the arguments are, are they're usually speed bumps. They're delays. They'll say, oh, look at this verse of the Quran. It, it does suggest that the Bible's been corrupted. Well, go through the verse, go through the passage, look at what it means, reconcile it with, what the, with, with the other passages that, where the Quran talks about the Bible and the Quran, and those aren't, none of them are good objections. And so maybe something like that, but guess what? We use arguments like that. So um, if you have something even more Cartesian than that, I'd be happy to see it. Um, but uh, again, you're not bound by my method. All right, Anthony, what do you got there? Yeah, Sam Lung asks, how do you know that your interpretation of the Quran is the way they interpreted it? Uh, I'd quickly answer that we have not only the Quran, which is largely unintelligible in itself, uh, but we also have the Hadith, which gives us the uh, understanding, uh, the practice, the beliefs, the likes, the dislikes of Muhammad, which is supposed to be the infallible key to interpreting the Quran. Uh, so uh, when we say that the Quran means X, we're not simply coming up with that. In fact, I don't know that many people could make heads or tails of the Quran if they didn't have that sort of thing to go on. Uh, and I just throw out there an example. Uh, uh, in Surah 17, 1 and 2, it says, Blessed be he that took his servant on a journey by night. Uh, I mean, it's a very uh, ambiguous passage. You don't know who the servant is. You don't know what kind of journey this is. You don't know where he goes. Uh, it does say from the, the nearest mosque to the farthest mosque, but you don't know what those are, uh, just from the verse itself. And, and, and that's just one of, you know, uh, 6,000 verses that you could you know, raise questions about. So nobody's really simply picking up the Quran and interpreting it on its own, not even those who claim to be Quran-only Muslims. Uh, I mean, for example, uh, you know, Quran-only Muslims wouldn't know who the Quran is fundamentally addressed to. M most of the Quran is Allah speaking to Muhammad. Allah telling Muhammad to say this, Allah telling Muhammad to say that, at least according to uh, the way Muslims understand it. But you wouldn't know that simply from reading the Quran because the Quran only mentions Muhammad's name four times. If you have a translation that mentions Muhammad's name four times, it's because the Quranic translators have added it in. In fact, if you pick up any Quran, you'll notice a lot of parenthetical uh, statements. Uh, if you see a, a parenthetical statement in the Bible, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not an indication that it's not there. Right? It's just that, that the thought was parenthetical to what the author was writing. But when you see parentheses in the Quran, it's because the translators have added it to explain what, what's going on there. And the source of the explanation is coming from the Hadith. And so when we, when we say the Quran means this or it means that, we're tracing our interpretation back to what Muslims claim is Muhammad's own understanding and practice with respect to that verse. Mm. Matt G asks, why is your profile photo One Punch Man? Um, well, that's because the story of One Punch Man was clearly stolen from my life. Um, I did not get any royalties from it, but um, if you watch the series, you'll notice some striking similarities. Um, you have others pulled up, or should I start uh, going to, through some of these other comments? I'm just looking for something good here. I was at here. 
Yeah, they, uh, they come they come really fast. Yeah. Uh, Renee asks if you'd be willing to debate Shabir Ali. Who me? No, my aunt Maple. Yes. Oh, uh, wait. obviously not me. I've debated him like nine times. <laughs> <laughs> so I have. Uh, it's still well. So there is a debate in the works, hopefully for November. Uh, however. My experience in the past has been that these things often fall through, So, and it doesn't fall through on my end. I do a lot of work in preparation for debates. I usually write uh, the equivalent of a book in preparation to respond to everything that the person I'm debating has ever said on the topic. And uh, so I usually work hard, and then on the uh, uh, other end of things, something happens, and... Uh, you know, it doesn't always go through. So I, I was set to debate Shabir in the past, and that didn't happen uh, due to a schedule conflict, he said. So we'll see if something happens in November. George George is supposed to be setting something up at Washington State. Well, that would be, uh, that would be an interesting one. Wait, Washington State? Yeah. Well, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah. What else do we got? Do Christians Kufar watch? <laughs> you know that has to be a good guy. Uh, Kufar watch says, "Do Christians believe that Jesus created the world? If not, then why worship someone who created nothing?" So he apparently doesn't think that we actually believe that Jesus created the world, that the Son created the world. So, um, Anthony, any passages that come to mind? Yeah, I can think of dozens off the top of my head. In John 1, verses 1 through 3, we're told that Jesus is the Word by whom all things were made. In fact, it's very significant the way it reads in the Greek. It says, in the beginning was the Word. It uses a particular tense that indicates that the Word had always been in existence. When, when everything began, the Word already was. But then when it goes on to say all things were made through him, according to most translations, the, the literal Greek is everything became through him. So it says, the word was, everything else became. And then, uh, that's why Jesus, later in the gospel, says of Abraham, before Abraham became, I am. That point's also obscured in some translations. Uh, some translations will say, before Abraham was born, I am. But the, it doesn't bring out the, the, uh, the pungency of the contrast. I am, Abraham became. So everything became through Jesus, according to John's Gospel. But not only John's Gospel. In Colossians 1, Paul says that all things were made through the Son, or through Christ. And it says all things were made by him and for him. So it's not just that everything was made by Jesus, but everything was made for him. And so that even heightens the necessity of worshiping Jesus. Jesus is the creator of everything, and everything was created for him. The same thing is seen in Hebrews 1, when... when the author says, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in many ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, through whom he made the worlds. And literally, the Greek says, through whom he made the ages, which means that he made the entirety of world history. Everything uh, that uh, has been made and everything that has happened has come into being and has taken place precisely because of the son. Uh, you also have... Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, where it says that there, for us there's but one God, the Father, by whom are all things, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. So there's just four passages off the top of my head, and we could easily give others. Mm -hmm. um, any idea on the topic of your debate with Shabir? Someone it's supposed that to be on Tawheed, uh, one debate on Tawheed, one debate on the Trinity. That's a good, that's a good setup, um, because... Uh, it's a it's a historic problem that if you it, and this is one of the reasons that that I started debating focusing a lot on Islam is um, back when I started getting involved in apologetics and uh, hanging out with uh, Nabil and trying to watch debates with him um, I noticed that all, almost all the topics were on Christian topics and that was smart that was very very smart of the early um, of the classic Muslim debaters to keep to keep the uh, Christians on the defensive, right? So debate on, uh, did Jesus die by crucifixion? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Is the Bible the word of God? 
Um, is Jesus God? Is the Trinity true? And almost every debate I could find back then was on some sort of Christian topic. And you'd watch what happened is the Muslim keeps attacking the Christian doctrine throughout the debate. And then at the end of the debate, the Muslim speaks last and he says, ah, you see all these problems? Now convert to Islam. What? <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Why would we convert to Islam after that? But that's, uh, that's how it worked. And so when I started debating, um, I would, I would insist if, if we're having Christian topics, we're going to do some Muslim topics as well. And uh, it was cool because I ended up debating the prophethood of Muhammad, I don't know, seven or eight times, something like that. And I wasn't even familiar with, with any debates on the prophethood of Muhammad uh, before that. So um, that was cool. But ne so in that situation, you basically have um, you basically have a couple of options. One, you can sort of do a combined topic like the Bible versus the Quran or Jesus versus Muhammad or something like that, where both topics are addressed or peace and violence in Christianity and Islam, where both ideologies are under, are under scrutiny in one debate. Now, the weakness of that is it just becomes too much. It becomes too much to cover. And so uh, the, the best way I think to do it is like uh, like that. So cover Trinity in one debate, cover Talheed in another debate. But uh, yeah, it's a good, uh, good approach. Should be should be good. Yeah. So Kufar says we're not answering his questions. What was? <laughs> what? <laughs> Didn't we just answer a question? Do Do we believe Jesus created the universe? Yes. <laughs> and so, so the next part was, if not, then why do you? Uh, well, we don't have to answer the if not because we we said that we do and we explained why. And if you think that the gospel is wrong, if you think that John one one is wrong, you got multiple problems. One. Um, that's the gospel that Muslims most frequently go to to prove the prophethood of Muhammad when they try to show that the Quran is correct when it says that there are biblical prophecies about Muhammad they go to the gospel of John in fact they even go to God, they even go to John 1:1 1, 1 to show that that there were three different people who were expected the prophet Elijah and the Messiah right they go to John 1:1 1, 1. so uh, those are some problems if you're now rejecting John 1:1 1, 1. but if you're rejecting what John 1:1 1, 1, you also have the problem that the Quran affirms our scriptures. The Quran orders Christians to judge by the gospel. And during the time of Muhammad, going back to the second century, the gospel, if you're talking about a text, the gospel referred to the fourfold gospel. The four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were treated as a unit called the gospel. And so if that's the inspired word of Allah there, and you're telling us, no, don't believe that Jesus created the universe, you got a problem there. So we are answering your questions. Um, doesn't mean you're able to grasp the answers, but we hope that you would, instead of just you know blasting out res responses and comments, that you would actually think about the issue here. If your God, if Allah commands Christians to judge by the gospel, and the gospel during the time of Muhammad was the fourfold gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you ask us a question, well, guess what? We're going to judge by the gospel. David and Anthony, do you believe Jesus created the world? Well, we have to judge by the gospel according to your God. And so we would judge, yes, he did. And you say, no, that's just nonsense. Okay, then you're telling us that your God gives really bad commands. <laughs> because you're telling us don't judge by the gospel. Your God says judge by the gospel. So you're telling us that your God is wrong. Well, that's fine, but you, you're not a Muslim anymore, just so you know. You've come, you're, you're an apostate now, so keep that in mind. Uh, got a super chat. Actually, we've had several super chats. I've been missing them all along. Um, sorry about that, guys. <laughs> Let me get one in here from Jordan Marshall. Jordan Marshall says, Hey, David, why do some Muslims believe that the English translations of the Quran are not literal translations, but yet we have 26 different Arabic Qurans? So which Arabic is the true version? Um, so they're kind of, uh, they're kind of two issues there. Um, why do Muslims believe that the English translations of the Quran are not literal translations? Well, to me, what the objection is, is that it's not actually the Quran. And Muslims typically use this to avoid criticism when you start bringing things up. Oh, look, it says right there, chapter 4, verse 34, that a Muslim man can beat his wife into submission. What's up with that? Ha! Well, that's not really the Arabic. <laughs> and so... The, the implication there is if you just went to the Arabic, you'd see there's no problem there 
whatsoever, dude. There's no problem there. And it's, it's of course, absolute nonsense, right? We know what the words mean, right? We know what that, that command means. Uh, so th that sort of thing is, is really a smokescreen. But Muslims, m Muslims don't realize is that this actually, there's a huge problem here. Namely, that if you go to the Muslim sources, the Quran is actually for Arabs, right? And I made a video called, um, look this up because um, Anthony can go ahead and add to this, but as far as my response, if you want a fuller response because you're asking the question, go to my video, why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. Why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. I think, that, I think that's what it was called. Um, if it's not, it's something close to that. But why the Quran was revealed in Arabic. What you find is that the Quran was revealed in Arabic because Arabs were the last people to receive a prophet. Everyone else had their prophet. Other groups had their books. And that's why Jews, in chapter 5, verse 43 to 44, Jews are commanded to judge by the Torah. Chapter 5, verse 47, Christians are commanded to judge by the gospel. They're not commanded to judge by the Quran. They judge by the gospel. But, but, Muslims are supposed to judge by the Quran. Why? Because in the context of the Quran, Muslims are just the last people to receive a revelation from God. So they needed a prophet who spoke their own language, Arabic, and then everyone had their book. But notice, the entire basis for giving the Quran was that Arabs needed a revelation in their own language. Other people had a revelation in their own language. But what does this mean? It means that the Quran cannot be from me, for me if the Quran was given so that people who speak that language can understand it in their language. Well, how in the world can that be from me or any other non-Arab speaking person, right? So... The Muslims bring this up as a defense and they don't realize if they actually think about it Islam can't be the religion for all people at least the Quran cannot be the word of God for all people right so so you can still say Islam is the religion for all people but people have revelations in their own language you could still say that as a Muslim but you can't say the Quran is the book for all people and so that would be the, the logical outcome of their objection want to add something to that Anthony? No, I'd like to get in, though, before we end. Uh, response. Oh, wait, wait, wait one, one second, one second. There, there was an, another part here. But yet we have 26 different Arabic Qurans, so which is the true version? Yes, to, to be clear, there are 26 different Arabic... Ver no, by the way, there are, actually, there are more than this. There are more than this. That's just what they brought, right? That's just what uh, Hatun Tash had collected in different parts of the Arabic world. And it's interesting, you can go through the comments in this, in the comments section... And they'll, people will say, no, these are the same Qurans, they just have different covers. Or, these are just translations. No, these are different Arabic versions of the Quran that are used by different Muslims in different parts of the world. You can open them up and look at them and find different Arabic words. And that's just the modern, that's just the modern problem. If you go back in history, you find much bigger problems than that. But Muslims would tend to do things like burn all the evidence to cover up all the differences. So I uh, hope that answers your question. We've got, we got videos on all these topics if you want to go, go, on, go through those. But Anthony, i uh, got six minutes left. Time is yours. Yeah, so Suleiman uh, Abdul Karim said, You don't understand John 1.1. 1, 1. What you fail to understand is God created everything in the world, including you and I, uttering the word, Be. So he's saying that when John says in the beginning was the word, he's referring to God's word be, which causes everything to come into being. So he's saying that's not Jesus. Jesus is himself a special product of God's spoken word be. Uh, and he gets this idea from uh, really a Muslim uh, apologetic trying to get around one, another one of Muhammad's many mistakes. In the Quran, Muhammad refers to Jesus as the Word of God, which is another indication that Muhammad was somewhat familiar, even if only uh, go, go somewhat familiar with Anthony, John's Gospel. Anthony, uh, you, you, you broke up right there for just a second, so go ahead and repeat that part. Yeah, uh, it's another indication that Muhammad was at least uh, somewhat familiar with John's Gospel, because the title for Jesus as the Word comes from John's writings. In fact, it's only found in John's writings. It's found in John 1, verse 1, John 1, verse 14. Uh, it's found in Revelation 19, as well as in 1 John, verses 1 through 4. So uh, this shows something of the fact that Muhammad was, to some degree, familiar with or aware of John's writings, even if he didn't have a good understanding of what they taught. Well, uh, in, so in the Quran, <clears throat> Jesus is referred to as Allah's word, but Muslims, in order to get around the significance of that, will say that it simply means that Jesus was created by Allah's word. But that, of course, isn't what uh, the Quran says. 
Now, that doesn't mean Muhammad had the Johannine understanding of that term when he used it for Jesus. Uh, he was just as confused about that as about most other things that he uh, heard from Jews and Christians. But uh, for in any case, in John's Gospel, the word that John is referring to <clears throat> is not God's spoken utterance. It's a person. Uh, it's very clear in John. It says, in the beginning was the word. So it's speaking of something that exists, that has being. And then it says... Kai uh, Theos, uh, well, uh, N arcane halagos, Kai halagos, ain prostan theon. Prostan theon means with God, towards God. And every time you have that construction in Greek, it always indicates motion or direction toward. The word was face to face with God. That's what it literally means. And then to make it very clear, it says the word was God, meaning he is all that the, the God he was with is. Uh, that might sound, uh, well, basically that's a reference to the Trinitarian relations within the Godhead. You have the Father and the Son, and the Father and the Son are in an eternal relationship with each other. So the Word is not a thing, it's not an utterance, it's a person who's been in eternal fellowship with God. And that's clear from verse 14 as well, when it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So there's no question in John's Gospel that the Word is a person, in fact, a divine person who's eternally been in fellowship with God and is the one through whom God made all things. All right, and uh, I think we're about out of time. We'll just jump on. We can tag team this. Uh, people are telling me to respond to Kufar Watch. I thought we have, but let's go ahead and take a look at this. Um, that is a false, a falsehood argument. You're saying that Jesus is God because the Quran tells you to judge by the gospel. Now, if Jesus created the world, then how is it that Jews killed their creator? Now, so just to be clear, I'm not saying I believe that Jesus is God because the Quran tells me to judge by the gospel. Um, I believe that Jesus is God because he's the one who rose from the dead and he claimed to be God. So that's why I believe Jesus is God. What I'm telling you is that when you deny that he's God, you're telling us not to judge by the gospel, which claims that he is God. So you're telling me not to judge by the gospel. But your God commands me to judge by the gospel. So you're contradicting your own God. You're, you're telling us to disobey Allah. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, says, judge by the gospel. That's what Christians are supposed to judge by. He says we have no ground to stand upon unless we stand fast by the gospel. And when we do that, we have to conclude that Jesus is God. You don't want us to conclude that, so you tell us to reject it. You tell us to reject what Allah says. Okay, so we'll reject what Allah says. We'll conclude that the Quran is a false book. But guess what? If we conclude that the Quran is a false book, then we don't have to pay attention to it. We don't have to listen to the objections that you give. The other part was, if Jesus created the world, then how is it that Jews killed their creator? Anthony, you got about 30 seconds to take a crack at that, but we can always uh, get back to this one tomorrow. Yeah, the, the simple answer is John 1, verse 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The mm -hmm. Word became flesh. Mm -hmm. So he's both the Word, the eternal, divine, second person of the Trinity, and a real human being. Jesus entered into human history as a real human being, and he suffered and died through his human nature. All right, so uh, we're, we're sure that many other questions are going to come up along those lines, uh, but you can see the Muslim objections usually revolve around ignoring that we're Trinitarians, ignoring the doctrine of the Trinity, and ignoring the Incarnation. So they'll, they'll proceed to critique Christianity after pretending that we don't believe in the Incarnation, we don't believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, and then all sorts of objections arise. Well, we agree that those objections would arise if you throw out basic Christian doctrine and then proceed to attack it without without understanding these basic Christian doctrines. Um, but we are Trinitarians. We believe in the Incarnation, and so these things just work out. Uh, we're glad that we have so many Muslims in the chat section here. Um, we look forward to interacting with you. We apologize for the uh, technical difficulties today. It was cool that we had uh, almost 400 people um, joining in the discussion here when even after, you know, even after multiple times of a of the internet going out. Um, so that's cool. And hopefully we get all this worked out by tomorrow and we will be happy to continue interacting with our Muslim friends. So all of you Muslims in the in the comment in the chat section there, 
please come back. Um, we know we didn't get to all the questions, and we won't we won't get to all the questions tomorrow. We won't get to all the questions the next day. But over time, we will start getting to all of the main questions. So uh, join us again tomorrow here on Answering Islam Live. And I always uh, I always push the button, not realizing that it cuts me off like 10 seconds earlier on the live stream. So this is the point of the stare.